for the uh, introduction and uh, thanks for the invitation to, for me to come speak here. I'm, I'm really excited uh, to come share with you about my excitement about microscopy and, uh, and, and about art. I, I, this talk is an outgrowth of both of the use of archival materials in my electron microscopy class, which is a modern science class. Um, but I also took that and then recently did a talk of the same name at the archives where members of the public could come in and, and work with the objects. And I thought that there were some ideas from that that I wanted to present here. But, but that was a little different because we didn't have, we don't have the objects here. So I thought, well, for the Steam Cafe, what I would like to do instead to bring in some new material for this venue that is really about you know, kind of the, the visual nature of microscopy and the connections in both directions between art and science and technology. So, um, so we can begin here. This is one of the texts that, uh, that uh, Dr. Donner would see in class. And, and I, 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 my disclaimer right now is, you know, I worked with the librarian that specialized in the history of science. So this is not going to be the history of microscopy. This is going to be about my experience and some of my thoughts on the field, and and so. But but my connection is I'm a material scientist. I love art, and I use microscopy extensively in my work. So so when I was a master student, I was working on ceramics materials, and this is actually aluminum oxide, and I used optical microscopy, you know, sort of like at the, that beginning image, and a lot of the materials from the books are going to be about optical microscopes. And then um, for my PhD, I use transmission electron microscopy, and I think some of the material scientists would know what that is, but transmission electron microscopy is it's a little different than scanning electron microscopy, where you can kind of see images of big bug eyes and stuff like that. Transmission electron microscopy allows us to probe materials at the atomic scale, so we can image materials you know, at atomic resolution. So an electron microscope, and I'll just introduce this just so you kind of have an idea. It was invented in the 30s, so this is the first one, Ernst Briska there, with uh, one of his graduate students building it. In the 90s, the Japanese made really big ones, so here's a person here in a very high voltage electron microscope. And this is the modern one that's at, at Oregon State University, it's a little bit more manageable in, in size, it's only about nine feet tall. And uh, so this is the electron microscope. And then, you know, so what I was doing in my PhD was again looking at materials. This is aluminum oxide. Again, and I was still working in, I was working in the same research group, but now with the metal, and I was looking, and this is, you might not be able to see it too well, but this is back in, you know, in the earlier 2000s. And now, you know, now I'm a professor, and I have, I'm teaching my, yeah, I'm teaching classes in electron microscopy, and I have graduate students. And so if the atomic resolution isn't too clear, you can see the advancement of the technology. This is an image that one of my graduate students, or this pair of images, is something that my graduate student took this summer at the National Center for Electron Microscopy in Berkeley. And so if you haven't seen an image like this before, and many people, if you're not material scientists, you might not have seen this, these bright dots are, are columns of platinum atoms. And it's not single atoms, you're looking at the top of a column. The brighter it is, the more platinum atoms there are in, in that column, kind of going into the direction of the screen. This area around it is the aluminum oxide. You can use two different detectors to kind of get a, a, what are called bright field and dark field images, where you get better contrast seeing the platinum on the left side and where the aluminum oxide is washed out. You can get that information here. And I think, you know, so now you're basically, you know, so this is pretty clear. This is atomic resolution, pretty much current, you know, kind of state of the art capability. Um, with a very nice instrument. So, so, um, but I'm not going to get too much into the science of this, but just kind of an idea of, of um, what, what we can do. But coming back to, to so that's, that's kind of my science, that's why I got talked about that earlier, um, earlier today. And, uh, but today I want to start off just with, with this idea of the, the looking at objects and, and history, and, and actually looking at historical objects, and, and, and how I got to this spot how Dr. Donovan, why she invited me here, why I had brought those texts to a electron microscopy thing. Even though these are op about optical, it started with this book. So this is Micrographia. It was printed in 1665 um, by Robert Hooke for material scientists, same Robert Hooke from Hooke's Law. 
And so, um, so that Robert Hooke, he was a, a polymath, made contributions to astronomy, um, was an architect, did microscopy, material science, to solid state physics, um, and, and biology. And so I saw this when I was an art history student, and I took a class on, um, I, I was at the, U, the Bay State School, I was at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, um, but we could take classes, there was a little consortium, and so the small private school, Smith College, had a very good um, uh, special collection in their, in their library, and they had a lot of rare books. And so this is one of the books that they had, first edition, and I saw it when I took a, a class as an, art, as an art history student on early printed books. And so it wasn't specifically science books, but you know they brought out all these early examples from the late 1500s and the 1600s. It was really cool. And and you know the the, the professor that was teaching, of course, brought this out. And I think I was really impressed when we turned it. When you fold, there there are these fold out pages. The manuscript is maybe this big, and then you fold out. This is a fold out leaf of an etching, and it's about this big. And it was beautiful. It kind of captures it captures the imagination. Um, and so, uh, so I decided that I would. I was always interested in art and science. So um, I'm a material scientist now. So, so I decided to do my term paper in that class on the his, the books that they had in their collection on the history of science. So that included this book, and then it also included other other books. And I don't remember the names of the other books, but there was one freaky one that was really old from the late 1500s, and it had a lot of stuff about spun like frogs coming from mud and you know all kinds of different creatures coming from you know pond water and where you know where all kinds of origins of, of life which you know is kind of called formally called spontaneous generation the idea that you can have life coming out of you know inanimate objects you know maggots coming out of raw you know old meat and stuff like that because they didn't they couldn't see that there were eggs in there they couldn't see that maggots come from flies and that and that frogs come from other frogs, not from mud. So, so, so you know, so, so I kind of, so, so this is kind of the point. And I wrote, and then, you know, I so, so I wrote, a, I don't remember what the term paper was, but I remember that. I remember, remember this book, and I remember that book. And uh, and so then when I, uh, you know, so then I did my art conservation career. You know, I graduated, did my art conservation career, studied material science. You know, was at Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and then ended up in 2015 at Oregon State University. And in getting to know the places, I had a tour of the library, and I met the librarian, and I saw their special art, special collections and archive, and I discovered that one of their collecting specialties was books on the history of science. And so I was like, oh, that's cool. And I met the librarian that, that you know, it's a big library, so it has a lot of librarians, and I met the librarian that was in charge of that, and she was so enthusiastic about getting the materials that they had into the hands of students and into the hands of the public. And so I was like, I, was, I wasn't teaching my electron microscopy class, so I was like, how do I get these things into the hands of students? And for some of the classes that I was already teaching, I couldn't quite figure out the way. But then, you know, I was hired and I have the experience in electron microscopy, so I developed a new course in transmission electron microscopy for graduate students, you know. Physicists and, and and material scientists and and engineers and and I was like now I was like I got a brand new class I had to make it from scratch but that means that I've got room to set aside some time to go to the special collections and so and so I did that and I, and and so I worked with the library we pulled out different materials and you know so there was not a first edition of Hooke's Micrographia they have a reprint of the of the etchings. And so, you know, these, which are, you know, so they're from the same copper plates, and it was printed about 75 years later um, by a man named Henry Baker, who printed books on microscopy. And so we could still see those things, you know, hold those objects, I could bring the students in. Um, but when I was, when I was preparing this and looking at all these things, I thought, you know, what's, what's the value of this? I mean, I was like, well, you know, why should art historians have all the fun? But then I was like, well, I like it. I was an art historian. Maybe I was just like, that's my thing. I like old stuff. You know, I like new things and old things. But I wasn't sure what value it would necessarily bring to the students. Like, maybe these, you know, young material science students aren't into old things. I mean, you know, I thought I'd be sure. Um, and 
so, but I was like, I was still the only to do it. And so, you know, it's, people do get, I think all the students have enjoyed it because, you know, then I could go and bring things from our collection, like this is from a, you know, new technologies, or at least new, new instruments, new, new capabilities. You know, this is from a French book on applied physics from the 1850s. Um, here is showing how you can do microscopy, and here is like a little, I think, a, a lapse or something. And uh, I'm showing, and this is this is a diagram showing illumination with electric light rather than with daylight. You know, so it's just like the, so so, uh, so but, and you know sample preparation techniques, and it's charming. It's like you know, it's charming little hand, disembodied hands, you know, doing dissection underwater, <laughs> and uh, so and and other things, you know, instructional things like bright field, dark field imaging, and I thought this would be nice because this is from a text from an 18, uh, uh, yeah, 65, the microscope and its revelations, and this was a little instruction for students on how to use the microscope, and was trying to reveal how if you change your lighting, you will get bright field image and dark field, and this is, I thought since I'm in the center of like fossil country, this is actually an image of fossilized shells in chalk, yeah, so they were, Showing that. But that's still, you know, I'm still being like, oh, is it just quaintness? Is it just like, oh, this is a, oops, a funky little image from geological explorations from the 40th parallel, so from the US government book in terms of like mineralogical survey um, that was done in the 1870s. And, uh, and I was going through this, and, and I think everyone enjoyed it, but as I was going through the materials, I came across this book. Oops, by Henry Baker, the one that actually did the reprint of um, Hope's book on micrographia with the big flea and stuff. And, and, and again, again, more point things. The animalcules in the teeth. So they used to call small microbes animalcules. Um, and, and, and it's a little horrifying. <laughs> and so I, was like, I was like, man, I hope it's not this one. <laughs> it actually ends up, it's figure one. It's just like, it's like, just like a little, a little dot, maybe horrible in its own way. Um, and so, and so, it's just in a seeing this, seeing this little book, and and then and I paged further through this book. So this is also I also it's there using things like this. The title of this is the microscope made easy. It's almost like the equivalent of you know like coding coding for dummies and stuff like that. You know, so the microscope made it easy. You know from from the eighteen uh, or actually this is from seventeen forty three. So, um, but then I came across this page. And it is chapter 15 on caution in viewing objects. And it's the second paragraph. And it, and it said, when you employ the microscope, shake off all prejudice, nor harbor any favorite opinions. For if you do, tis not unlikely that fancy will betray you into error and make you think you see what you would wish to see. Remember, the truth alone is the matter you would search after. And if you've been mistaken, let not vanity seduce you to persist in your mistake. And as my process, I was just like, this is, and like, I was like, I, I read the students and I'm like, this is required reading. <laughs> <laughs> it is required reading for any microscopist when you're doing your science and you're trying to get information. And then suddenly you're at the microscope and you're looking at this tiny little area and you're kind of looking for something. Like you go there and you want to find something. And, and it, it's such an easy pitfall. And it's not just with microscopy. Then I, you know, I thought, I was like, all my students have to, have to read this. This is like, you can come, you can look at any of the books, you can, pick, you can stay for five minutes, and then you can leave if you want, or when we visit the archive, but you gotta read this. And, and, uh, and actually, my students, my graduate students, find, find this useful, because they're like, oh yeah, that happens. Um, and then I was like, man, it's good for any scientist, and I think it's probably just good in general to kind of reflect on the limits of our knowledge. And so, so this became kind of my motivation for, for, bringing, for bringing this in. And, it, and it's kind of interesting when you can kind of go back then, and, and I think that there, there is value in looking at historical objects, because I think then, not just, especially in our education with science, is that a lot of times in our modern textbooks, material scientists, they still teach Hooke's Law. You know, it's, it's, still, it's still used. And Hook, you know, he did stuff with crystallography. He looked at snowflakes. So this is going back to, to Robert Hook's micrographia. And, and actually even was like looking a little bit at crystal. There was no atomic theory, but just thinking about packing it, coming up with, you know, how do you get these crystal structures? And he gave us the word for cells. 
So he looked at pork, and, and he saw cells. And, and, we, and he made them cells for, for a monk's cell, because they were empty. And he saw them, and he saw them, and they were empty. He didn't realize that there was stuff in there. And so he thought that they were kind of sterile. And he actually kind of explained life. He actually believed in spontaneous generation. So he believed in something that we now know is completely bogus. And even at the time there were scientists doing that, he made all these contributions. And you can't fault him necessarily. He made lots of contributions. But it's just he was limited in terms of the current thinking of his time. And you know, one person can't do everything. And so he made his contributions, but still limited by, by his time. And so I that gives us an opportunity that we're doing science. And we're doing, when we do it, we are exploring the unknown. And we have to keep in mind that we don't necessarily have, know what our limits are. You know, we're kind of exploring, we're trying to find this, this edge. And so it's something that all you can do is make your best effort in um, kind of dealing with that. Like, what are our prejudices? It becomes hard when you don't have an outside view. I think looking at these historical objects and not looking at a modern textbook that has cleaned up the story, but looking at the objects, like some science is made by people, and <coughs> dealing with the problems of the time and limited by their times. And I feel like kind of handling these objects can kind of really bring it, bring it home. So, um, so this is the kind of the historical part. Um, but I still want to talk about some of the pitfalls of microscopy because we still have them, and in fact, they're even I think they're even worse now because. Um, you know, the, the flea and everything, it's on a, a scale that we understand. It's kind of like, this is a, this is a picture, not a micro microscopic image, <laughs> but kind of an amusing little picture. And it's, but it's from a micro, an electron microscopy textbook. It is from uh, uh, Williams and Carter Transmission Electron Microscopy. And, uh, you know, what, would anyone, what is this a picture of? Two rhinos. Two rhinos. Uh, obviously, obviously two rhinos. Um, you know, and, and you're thinking, but, but really what information, what's the real information that you have on this? I mean, in terms of the raw information are intensities of light. You know, this is bright, this is bright, this is dark, it's a shadow. In terms of if I don't want to bring my prejudices to something, you can interpret this image because you've already got a lot of the information. Even if you've never seen a rhinoceros, you've seen other mammals. You might have even seen a two-headed calf in a museum. I've seen a two, the skeleton of a two-headed calf. The heads are on one end. You never have them on the two ends. So it's up, you see this, you don't even have to see the little toes here. That's unnecessary. You have a lot of experience that you're bringing to it, and you could call it prejudice, but you could call it also just the information that you need to have in order to interpret what is simply a two-dimensional ray of bright and dark. And I understand the shadow. I understand from my experience that there's sunlight on the back of a rhinoceros, all of those things. But the, our technology has advanced. You know, so with you know, an image like this, or even in some of the optical microscopy, you can still be fooled. They were still worried about that in the 1700s, about being fooled when you're looking through the microscope. But it's even worse now, because this is the other part of the figure in the textbook of an atomic resolution image of aluminum. Now, the thing is, I've held aluminum, but when the information here is like, well, where are the atoms? Are they where it's white? Are they where it's dark? Is that a hole? Is, that, is there something there? And even if I've held aluminum, I've never experienced it. My experience is on the scale of centimeters. I have no, I have no sense a uh, daily sense of something that's on the order of a 10 billionth of a meter. And so then you have, there's no choice. Even with the rhinoceros, you have to bring knowledge to that image in order to be able to interpret it. And in terms of we have to bring our knowledge, and we just hope that when it becomes very far from our daily experience, that our interpretation isn't far off. And I feel like this is not just a problem in, you know, so. Actually, this. And I feel like it's not just a problem in microscopy. And so now my graduate student, you know, she's got me as an advisor, and now she has to start interpreting her images. And I'm like, what I want is the atomic structure. 
right here, you know, kind of right at that interface and kind of relate that to our understanding of the bonding between the metal and the oxide. And we work with collaborators using, you know, kind of our best computational methods to calculate what we think the bonding should be. And now we have to bring that. So that is our, our current problem. But this is not just a problem with microscopy. I think it's a problem with all kinds of um, experimental methods where we're, we're, we're pushing techniques and uh, even computational methods of dealing with data that have become so far from our day-to-day -day activities that, that, we have to, that we, have to, we have to find a way, and part of it is, I suppose, um, the process of scientists looking at each other's work. But you, know, you, can take, you can turn the microscope around and make it a telescope. And then you think, I don't know if people had seen this image that was, came out in April of the image of the black hole, which again is sort of collected from telescopes all over the uh, world. And then sophisticated techniques using to, used to basically integrate that data into something coherent. And you know, so there's a lot of interpretation on that. So, so that, those are my reflections on um, kind of the dangers in microscopy and maybe how like looking at historical objects can both uh, give you perspective on science as a process done by human beings and flawed as we are and also what our tools, the range our tools can give us that, that really extend our range of what we can experience which is also has pitfalls on its own. Um, so at this point I wanted to take a, a kind of take a turn if there are, unless I can take some questions on this, but I wanted to take a turn on the concept of, you know, just the integration of art and how, how does art fit on into this? One could say that some of those objects, some of those etchings were art, in, was artistic in themselves. There, were, there was probably an artist, Robert Hooke probably did not do those etchings himself. There was probably a drawing produced and that went to a professional printmaker who did the who would, that would, be, would have been a normal mode of work at that time. Um, so, but I want to kind of just bring the conversation so that you know, we would have different points where we could talk about um, art. So, so I, I like art a lot. You know, I studied art history. I did art conservation for a while. And so this was the optical microscopy. And, and you know, sometimes doing measurements of like the spacing between those pores, like, you know, I love material science. Even that could be a little bit dull. But sometimes it was nice because in the same samples, like at the edges, sometimes you would see things that would look like this if you changed to a different imaging mode. And you would see that now the pores are light and the interference colors and the making them orange. And you know, so this thing. So, so you can kind of see cool things. And I would say this is for me, this is no longer science. I'm using the microscope. But for me, I just, it was aesthetically pleasing. And it can kind of, it kind of kept me going sometimes, just, you know, take a little break from the sciencing and kind of look at these objects. Then this is another thing, Same, similar samples, all aluminum oxide, and you get some interference colors, and the porosity is kind of growing. So this was all developed during, during firing of these samples. And I, I submitted some of these to, to microscopy competitions, to the Nikon Small World, and got some, got some prize, got a little bit of prize money that way. Especially with things that look like this, with like it, I think it looks like aliens landing on a city. <laughs> That's my, my interpretation of this, and, and other things. So you see these. So I don't know. I, I feel like it's been, for me, this is then using the tools of science to make sort of artistic things that have an artistic interpretation. I really don't see this as a scientific object. And same thing, like you know, my microscopy science, and then you can see kind of like this is kind of cool at a lower magnification. And sort of some fun things. And again, the things that look like other things, like this one I see as like a cliff at night with a starry sky. And, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we have these things. And so, so I just wanted to finish up um, you know, the, the, the field of art and science and places where there, there are lots of people working in this overlapped area. And so I thought I wanted to not just talk about what I did, but, but Taking examples, I thought I wanted to talk about two other two other people, people that I know. I figured I'll kind of limit limit the range. Uh, one of them is a scientist that makes art. So this is uh, Jerry Bartholomew. She is the head of the microbiology department at Oregon State University. She studies um, uh, fish and fish, pa fish pathology, viruses, and other infections in fish and, and, and things like this. And she, but on the side, she makes fused glass art. 
And some of it has nothing to do with science, but some of it is actually from the microscopy. So there we have some images where she has kind of taken a piece and has incorporated images from the diatoms, so some of the imagery. A little bit different, sort of starting to pull it into like an actual art object. I feel like with my microscopic images, I'm like, I use the same camera as what I did, where she is taking the images that she has seen and kind of injecting them, kind of inspired by her science. And then I, this is the piece that I got, where she was actually using the fused glass and then actually incorporating objects from the lab that she was kind of inspired by there, you know, just day to day working with it. And, and some of them are old things from her lab, like an old glass file. And these are actually old, no longer current, like films from uh, an electron microscope a little electron microscope sample and some vials, and these are fish viruses. And, and, uh, you know, so, so in terms of kind of just like, probably like any artist, would, it takes inspiration from the world around them, from their observations around them. And so a scientist, when they choose to make art, sometimes are inspired by the things that they see. The other person that I want to talk about is Marav Tsar. I met her when I uh, lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. She's from Israel. And um, when I knew her, she was just finishing up. She, 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 she could paint beautifully, but she kind of went from painting and then decided to move her artwork to some different things, some installations and some participatory art. And a lot of it will play on science and um, culture and things like that. So, so she's made up sort of a, a research institute, the, the Sarah Gray, a faux research institute, the bogus research that was Sarah Gray. And here she's kind of placed herself at an archaeological dig. And I may have helped her with some little microscopy images at some point for an early piece. And I just wanted to talk about a couple of pieces where, she, where now this is kind of using the trappings of science for art. Kind of before we had scientists being inspired by what they saw and making art about it. Now this is an artist looking at the activities of scientists partly as a cultural thing and partly just as a playful thing. So she would use, so this was actually an installation that she had in Wichita where she had a, um, a small microscope with a computer and a screen and, and the whole idea is she wanted people, she had a lab notebook out and people were to come in and, and draw what they saw. They could, they could use any of the samples and they could take notes. And part of it, there's a little play in it because she was kind of inciting people to do things that were unscientific. And I see this as it's just fun. It's, it's fun. And I think, I think the scope of, of art can be a lot broader than science sometimes. Scientists have fun, but kind of strip a lot of it out when you're writing a journal paper. Whereas, the, you know, so whereas artists will make observations about the world and interpret them, but the presentation could be very different. And so, in this, you might not be able to read it, but the the sample had been textile from Utopia, or this had been alien dandruff, and so these were just household <laughs> objects. And you know, so she was kind of inviting people to to put in a little bit you know, to to play. And there was another piece that um, was in Oakland, and I had sort of, I had actually participated in this, so it didn't involve microscopy. Um, but here is where she brought in some collaborators um, to perform a, a, almost like a little bit of theater in a, in a kind of participatory art uh, piece where people would come into the research headquarters and with her, each of us, each of the collaborators designed like experiments that we would do, and the public could come in and watch us or participate with us. And so the woman here, Penny Jennings, she had designed this where people would look at, she had created an elaborate classification for periods, printed periods on paper. And she had made a classification system because they all look kind of, when you look at it, they're transformed when you look at them through a microscope because the ink goes on the paper fibers differently. So she did this and then people could come in and look through the microscope and start drawing what they saw. And, and, and actually there it was kind of encouraged in this kind of little theory, you know, kind of participatory art piece for them to like, they were kind of encouraged to like add some emotional content which kind of becomes a little bit inappropriate, but it's, it's, fun. it's fun, it's good, but, but it's kind of like, but, but you have the microscope as this thing that's kind of signifying science, 
and, and also that's changing your view of an everyday object, of like the period, because you know now we've got the whole household classification of like loofah, sponge, mitten. You know, it's just you know, kind of kind of absurd, but fun, and, and it's not bad for people to have fun. Anyway, so these are these are sort of my collections of thought. Microscopy, history, objects, art, science, and uh, yeah, so everything that can ensue from that. So I just want to thank um, Jerry Bartholomew and Marat Sor for um, kind of agreeing to let me highlight their work. Uh, you know, I talked to both of them about this, and they were quite enthusiastic at the idea of kind of something like this. And also, Andy, Dr. Anne Beatty, she is the um, librarian that specializes in the history of science at Oregon State University, and I worked with her. She was so helpful in you know, finding things within the collections that would be appropriate for use in my TM class and in my electron my and, and in my in my public lecture. And so I'm gonna end here with another one of my images and uh, you know we can uh, I would love to start a comment not, not take necessarily take questions but maybe have a conversation. Does anybody does anybody have any questions for Dr. Sample? Thank you. Um, what was what what was the publication about with that quote about wishful thinking? Oh, that, so that was The Microscope Made Easy by Henry Baker. And uh, I, I can give you, I, I can give you, after our words, I can give you all the bibliographic information if you'd like. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> Questions? No? Well, I have a question. Um, sorry. Well, I'll just uh, speak loudly. Uh, what, what's your favorite micrograph that you've ever taken? Was it because it looked artistic, or was it because it was so difficult to take? You know, there was so much that went into it on, on the science side to actually make it happen. You know, all those things that I, in my technical talk earlier with the dynamic TEM, those experiments were so hard, but those aren't my favorite micrographs. My favorite micro, like in terms of, like if I look at a favorite, it's, it's the ones that for me are aesthetically pleasing. Like the science for me is satisfactory when the information comes in that all gets integrated together. But I'm a very visual person. And so like for me, like when I think of favorite micrograph, it's like, you know, the ones that are like, are pretty, pretty much lacking in, in scientific content. <laughs> uh, but, but I enjoy the science, it's a different thing, you know, but the, my favorite image is gonna be the aesthetic one. So what is that? So this, um, so, so, does it look like a bunch of little skulls? So this is a, a thin, so this, so this is a thin film of um, germanium. Uh, so, so a, a semiconductor, and it's it was my intention was when I when the, the thin film had originally been amorphous, so it was like a glass. It was disordered, and uh, this was an instrument that is built at Lawrence Livermore uh, National Lab. It has a um, it has it, it, it is equipped with a, a laser and that you can actually hit the sample with it. So all I wanted to do was crystallize the sample. And, and actually just see the, the crystallization process. But the laser energy was too high, and so it ended up that this part of the film like melted. And, and then, and then, and then the, the wet edges drew back, they kind of de-wet off of the surface, and it was getting light in the day, and as soon as I saw the little skulls, I was like, you know what? This is real. Like, yeah, so it was just, this was unintended. You know, I wasn't trying to melt the film. I accidentally I wanted to crystallize it, but I accidentally melted it. And then I just looked at this. And I'm like, I'm gonna stop now. It's it's like it's six o'clock. <laughs> when you look through a microscope, do you still get that thrill of discovery? I work with children, and they always get so excited when they get to look through the scope and see something. You still experience that? Yeah, well, yeah, I do. I mean, but I'm, I'm pretty excited about this. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I actually really enjoy, and, and you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of, a lot of the high-end microscopy takes a lot of work when I, when I look for students, because science, is, some science is boring. You know, some of it, it's kind of a drag when you're like you're talking to, I'm talking to the grad students when you're kind of hacking away, you're like, where are you going to get to the end? Or you're, and uh, so, so, but it's okay if it's your thing. 
you know. So for me, I'm a very visual person, and like it never gets old. Actually, for me, seeing a diffraction pattern, seeing you know cool image, seeing new material, you know, seeing the new information, the scientific content when I'm at the microscope, that's exciting. Maybe not my most, ex maybe not the most exciting micrograph, but it's exciting for me to learn something new, and and I like that. But because science can be a bit of a chore, like making the measurements between the pores and the, <laughs> the ceramics, or or trying all day to to crystallize germanium and still not getting it at six o'clock, and then like blowing through the film, you know that's you know so so there can be things that are tiring. So you kind of find what is your thing. So when I'm looking for students, I'm looking for the ones that when they see the micrographs, I can see the sparkle in their eye, because <laughs> I'm hoping for them it's not going to get old, at least by the time they get their PhD. <laughs> I have a question. Could you tell us about your time at Mount Rushmore and what you were doing at that point in your career? Okay, so I was, at that point, I was a very, I was a very new conservator. It was uh, my first, um, my first job out of training, so I got a master's degree in, in art conservation. And I worked for a small company in Los Angeles, um, and a husband and wife team. So and I was their first like full-time trained employee. And, and they were known um, not only in doing just painting conservation, but the husband, it was a second career for him. He had been a physical chemist and had to deal with a lot of technical problems. And, and uh, they got to be known for being able to like work with large artworks, like some engineering problems, and, and just as a small company, being able to do a lot of different things. So when the Park Service was re re um, reworking their uh, visitor center, I think this was about 20 years ago, they wanted to take some of the um, Borglum's models, and uh, some of them are very large, and have them remounted and presented. Um, but also needed conservers just to take care of the things that were you know, falling apart on the objects. And so, you know, I was a new employee, and we just spent a few days. I, you know, I was helping just to. Um, I didn't do any of the designing of the mounts or, or that, but I was there to help catalog the materials and also just deal with some some of the um, uh, a few small items in terms of caring care for the objects in terms of uh, conservation of the objects. And so that was really fun. I, I, I really enjoyed that, and I enjoyed spending time. It was in the middle of the summer, and so we got to one of the, uh, the park rangers. Since they don't want people on the top of the heads, the park rangers have to do sweeps. And we were allowed to, when we took a break, to like do a sweep to go to the top of the heads, <laughs> which, I, which I really enjoyed. I, I, I enjoyed that. I was also able to, to visit a couple of the sites in the area, which was a, a pleasure. So I, I try to get it in on the side. It can be tough, especially as a as a, as a new professor. So you, so I I mean I've always loved both art and science, and I think ever since I was I ever since I could remember, I was like I wish the day was twice as long and I could do one and then the other. And this is just this is not just with art and science, but this is a lot of work life balance, family everything. You you have to prioritize. Um, for me, I love art so much that even though I know I'm like, oh, I, and after a while, I just I have to stop sciencing. So then I will. So then I'll start making things. And actually, at Oregon State, I, I do have another slide. Um, so so for me, I, I did a lot of drawing and painting. And when I when I took the job as a professor, I had so little time for it. I could when I would do it, I could feel I was out of practice and I was getting worse and worse, and, and which was really frustrating. So I decided to learn something new that I could just do maybe once a week and get better and better. So, so I, I took, I, so I took, a, 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 I had not ever done made pottery. So I took a class, and there I figured out, I'm going from knowing nothing, like if I could make a pot. And so I did that a couple of years ago, and now, now I've made a, a bunch of things. So I go in and I, and I make, and I make stuff, and these have nothing to do with science. This is just like I go in. I, I sometimes will think about ceramics, and then I stop thinking about science for a while. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. I think about alumina, and then I'm like, okay, I'm just going to do this this now. <laughs> So, so yeah, so this is this is prioritizing just everything in life. <laughs> all the all the things that you get that you have to do. Any other questions? What made you want to shift your 
career from um, the art history? So art conservation. I studied art history so that I could, the conservation, I had thought that the art conservation was going to be a really good way to combine my interests in art and science because it's, it's restoration. So you're working with objects and you need to know, you need to know things about art history, you need to know things about the art materials because if you're trying to preserve the materials, you have to understand what things are made out of and you have to use appropriate materials. But I guess, um, so I've always been interested in, in both, and I thought that that would be a good way of combining the two. But after a few years of working, I realized that, man, I loved working with art every day, and I learned so much about art by working with art that had been produced out of all different periods, you know, in Austria and Los Angeles, and you know, working with the maquettes in terms of like the the, the artist and, and learning about how he made his uh, you know models to, to that became the models for Mount Rushmore. All of that was really interesting, but I, I realized that um, I learned about materials and I realized that my interest in, in the science of materials, uh, that I wasn't really satisfied with that anymore, that I, I kind of topped out in what I needed to know because a lot of things were made out of the same materials. And so I just, I wanted to go deeper. And I thought, or, and, and also for the art, I wasn't doing my own creative thing. You kind of have to suppress my own creative thing when you're working on somebody else's art to really just serve in that. So while I, that was satisfying and that I thought it was incredibly valuable, like I think the preservation of cultural heritage is very valuable, I realized that I couldn't keep on doing it for 30 years. And I was like, I gotta go deeper into one or the other, but I love both. And I thought, there is no chance that I'm gonna do science in my garage. Like, in this day and age, you need infrastructure, and I mean, you need the community, I need the community, I'm not that brilliant, I'm not that brilliant. And even the, the stories about people starting businesses in their garage, usually they had some connection to larger industry and, and things like that beforehand. So um, I just decided that, and, and it was scary at the beginning, but I was like, I think I'm gonna try material, I think materials, I'm gonna try it, and then I just did it, and I, and I loved it. So it was simply taking the interests that I had all along and changing the focus to, to kind of satisfy what I realized I needed from my professional work. And I just wish I had more hours in the day to make like other stuff. <laughs> more questions? Okay, well that seems to be it, I think. Um, can we get another round of applause for Dr. coordinator at the School of Mines, Wyatt Engel, is going to speak about the eSports program, uh, which is very new, uh, less than a year old. Um, so if you want to find out more about the growing field of eSports and how it relates to computer science and computer programming and athletics, please come on December 17th at 6 p.m. All right, thank you. Enjoy your evening. Three or four of pizza before you go. Thank you all for coming.